The history of the Seattle Engineering Department is the history of Seattle. In 1929, for instance, if you lived in West Seattle, you would have had to fight the traffic at Admiral Way and West Spokane Street on the way to work each morning. And you would have had the same problem each evening on your way home. In those days, if you worked for the engineering department, maybe you worked with the paving crew at Yesler Way and Occidental. Or you could have been an inspector and witnessed the construction of the Hanford Street sewer outfall. Or maybe you worked for the maintenance division during the big rains of February and March. Or, possibly, you were cleaning out catch basins with this modern eductor truck. Not many of us can remember the Denny Hill regrade operation. These remarkable shots show portions of contract number two, which covered an area of 38 city blocks and included what is now the location of the Space Needle and Seattle Center. This tremendous operation was one of the first major earth-moving projects in the country. It was during this period of the late 20s that Washington State safety records proved that many accidents had little or nothing to do w with safeguarding equipment. It was the way people worked and the care they exercised. Although the Denny Hill regrade was done by private contract, it was under direct supervision of the city engineering department, and a campaign of safety was conducted to make the workers aware of their job hazards. With the result, that not one major accident was reported during the three years of construction. Over four million cubic yards of earth were moved, and some cuts were as high as 89 feet. Networks of conveyor belts carrying tons of earth converged on the waterfront. The earth was then deposited on self-dumping barges. The barges were then, in turn, towed away by tugboats. When a designated location was reached, Valves were opened, flooding the ballast compartment on one side of the barge, causing the center of gravity of the load to shift. Thus, the load itself dumped the barge. And as if by magic, the bottom of the barge became the top, ready for another load. The Denny Regrade excavation was truly an amazing engineering feat. Safety has long had a place in the Seattle Engineering Department, and through the years, many ideas have been tried. One experiment was tried in 1933 when a device called the Yielding Barrier was installed on the Montlake Bridge to afford added protection to motorists. An electrical device lowered the barrier, and at the time of impact, a spring system took over to decelerate the vehicle. It was found that the barrier mechanism wasn't strong enough to take the impact to a point where it was out of commission each time a car went through the primary gates. Yes, the Seattle Engineering Department has been in business many years, and many memorable engineering projects have been accomplished. Not all without personal injury and loss of life, however. In 1950, the record shows 60 city employees injured for every million man hours worked. An accident review board was formed in 1951, and immediately greater progress in safety became apparent, for in that year, the frequency rate dropped from 60 to 29 city employees injured for every million man hours. The primary function of this board was to secure all the facts of a particular accident, both traffic and industrial, and find ways to prevent a recurrence. A system of points was devised to assess responsibility for each accident. Today, the Accident Review Board consists of employees representing a cross-section of every job classification. Each member serves for one month, and eventually every department employee will have the privilege of serving on this board. Each week, the Accident Review Board agenda contains examples of accidents that should never have happened. A crew of men were working on a drainage problem, and they needed one more timber to complete the job, and someone yelled, throw another one down. The timber took a bad bounce, result, a lost time accident. Picture of an accident that should never have happened. Recently, the board reviewed another case. A man opened a swinging door. When the door closed, it caught his finger and the finger was amputated. One of these men will have an accident today because he is safety lazy. 
Being safety lazy means that he will disregard a known job hazard in order to try to save time. Every year, over 80% of our accidents result from being safety lazy. Two men climbed safely out of this truck. Safety lazy himself jumped and sprained his ankle. Accidents are destructive, disturbing, and wasteful, yet many of us never picture ourselves as the victim. What may start out to be a routine workday could end up in tragedy. Even here, these men are inviting trouble. The truck carries no warning flag or flashing lights, and there is no apparent concern by these men that an oncoming car could ram the rear of the truck and possibly catch them in the process. Mechanical warning devices alone cannot do an effective job if the men who use them fail to stay alert and fail to plan an out should something go wrong. Of course, there are other hazards too. A little asphalt in the tailgate latch prevents it from catching, so you try to clear it with your hand. Due to the number of hand injuries caused in working around the tailgate of a truck, the Accident Review Board once again strongly urges you to be aware of the danger. If the tailgate is fouled and won't close, use a stick or the shovel handle. Safety is in your hands. Some men avoid asking questions because they don't want to appear stupid. Others won't make suggestions for fear of being called eager beavers. But here is a man who cares enough to put safety first and suggests the use of a small piece of rug in the truck to overcome a known job hazard. Asking questions and sharing ideas will increase your chances of working through the year with no accidents. Probably more books, magazine articles, safety films, and pamphlets have been published concerning back injuries and safe lifting practices than any other subject in the field of industrial safety. In the en engineering department, even more emphasis has been focused on this subject. For the main topic at many safety meetings is how to lift safely. There's a reason for this. In one year alone, 15 employees suffered from back strain or injury by lifting improperly or trying to lift objects too heavy for one man. Yet, so many of us continue the attitude, why keep telling me how to lift? I've been working at this business for years and haven't hurt myself yet. Statistics often leave no impression and are easily forgotten. However, 20% or one out of five industrial accidents in past years were back injuries. Only one-tenth of this number had previous trouble. Sometimes the weight of the object doesn't make the difference. And if you continue to poo-poo the practice of safe lifting, eventually you too will become a statistic. To suffer from back strain is tragic when the safe way is the easy way. The experts tell us to look at the mechanics of the back. Here we can easily observe the torso and shoulder muscles working in coordination to form a powerful lifting team. But they cannot prevent injury to the spinal column if you insist on lifting the wrong way. In comparing man with machine, we are led to believe that our body is a mechanical system composed of a series of levers and hinges actuated by cables. Overload this system suddenly or frequently and it will fail. Women and clerical workers are no exception. They are susceptible to back injury or hernia when unsafe lifting habits permit strain on their back and abdominal muscles. Even this series of levers and hinges will fail if she continues to lift in this manner. The reason most of us bend at the waist, of course, is to reach down to pick something up. We do it unthinkingly, and then we have to literally lift with the back to raise the object. If we would bend our knees when reaching for an object, keeping the back in as nearly a vertical position as possible, and then lift by straightening the legs, there would be less strain on the back. Get close to the object and hold it close so that the center of gravity is close to what you are lifting. If you find the object too heavy or bulky, ask someone to help you. Every person who has had a hernia or an injured back knows the importance of practicing proven methods of safe lifting. Why wait until you have learned the hard way that these injuries can be avoided? Lift the safe and easy way. 
Seattle's never-ending maintenance program requires engineering department crews to work in moving traffic areas many hours of the day and night. Whenever a crew blocks a driving lane, a traffic hazard exists. This operation appears to have adequate protection. However, those who placed the warnings left out two important protective devices, the preliminary flagged redhead cone and the standard men at work sign or burglar alarm. If a speeding vehicle were to go through this project, the first object it would strike would be the high level warning. The steel pipe standard could become a dangerous projectile and cause injury to the driver, the workman, or damage to other vehicles. These men undoubtedly are doing a professional job of street repair, but none is aware of the vehicle approaching behind them. It cannot be emphasized too strongly that serious accidents can happen unless steps are taken to protect ourselves every minute that our job requires us to work in moving traffic. Here is the inevitable result of a rear-end collision caused by following too closely. But is this the complete story? Notice the position of the high-level warning standard which suddenly blocks one lane. Experience has shown that there is an urgent need to give the public adequate warning of unusual traffic hazards and protect them from these hazards. Equally important, of course, is the protection of our men and equipment. All coning operations must be planned in advance and adjusted to fit each traffic condition. Wherever you go, whatever your job may be, if your schedule requires you to work in the street area, you should know the procedure of correct coning. Protection of the men placing cones is most important. One man must have the responsibility of protecting the crew and equipment. He should face the oncoming traffic and direct vehicles clear of the hazard until all warning devices have been placed. He should keep alert and always leave himself an out and warn others should something go wrong. Five additional steps of coning must be taken for minimum protection. The preliminary warning or flagged redhead cone, cones to feather traffic away from the work area, the men at work sign, the high level warning for heavy traffic flow, and additional cones to keep traffic from re-entering the construction area. These pictures show a better way to divert traffic into one driving lane. The low-level warning and instructional signs are advanced far enough ahead to allow traffic to merge without confusion. The men who placed this coning operation planned in advance the solution to this seemingly difficult but really simple problem of safe coning procedure. Remember, protect the men who place the warning cones. Use a flagman. Place preliminary flagged redhead cone well out in front. Use additional cones to feather traffic. Place men at work sign inside the coned area. Back it up with the high level warning. Use additional cones to guide traffic past the danger zone. All projects can be made safer if you know your job hazard and care enough to do something about it. The problem of housekeeping has come up from time to time, and while this scene was staged, some projects have looked as sloppy as this. Men have been injured, and working time has been lost because of careless habits in keeping the job safe. Would you work in the bottom of this excavation? A careless step by a careless employee, and you would be the victim. You could be a hospital case. You can tell if your job is safe. A clean job is a safe job. The department safety rules of the job state that much of our work is classed as extra hazardous. You have been told that this is a hard hat job, but wearing safety hats alone will not prevent accidents. If your job requires extra personal devices, don't take chances, ask questions, check out the proper equipment, and be sure that your equipment is in good condition. A review of some of our operations emphasizes that we should follow the A, B, C safety plan. 
turning machines, swinging booms, and buckets are just a few of the hazards here. Some of the hazards on this project are obvious. Stepping on rubble or tripping may cause a sprained ankle. Firm footing when working here reminds us to step on your eye. Improper handling of equipment or careless lifting practices can cause painful back injury. Proper clothing on this job is essential. Heavy shoes, gloves, and safety goggles. Most jobs require safety clothing of some type in addition to your hard hat. And protection of men and equipment in traffic areas is imperative. Here again, safe lifting practices should be followed. And be sure you stay clear of the other fellow's shovel. When you climb out of that ditch at lunchtime, watch your footing. Clearing brush from the right-of-way includes hazards which have been discussed many times. Regardless of your job, regardless of where you work, always be aware of your job hazards. Be prepared to protect yourself. Care enough to plan it out. This is our ABC safety plans.